Guys, we've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And if you've been listening to our podcast, you might have heard an excerpt from The Jordan Harbinger Show where a woman talks about her experience with the Westboro Baptist Church. If you were intrigued by that, you wondered what it was, and you really wanted to listen to more, well, The Jordan Harbinger Show is for you. Jordan Show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. And Jordan always has the most interesting interviews and I promise you if you listen to his show you will learn something new and you will be absolutely riveted while you do it. Jordan's always focused on pulling useful practical insights out of his brilliant guests and we're not talking about pop psychology or wishy-washy self-help stuff here. The episodes are loaded with bits of wisdom that you can use to legitimately change your mind and improve your life right away. If it's not worth checking out, I'm not sure what is. We really enjoy this show and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we look at the day after Heyman Lee went missing. and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my not-homely-at-all co-host, Alice. <laughs> Hi, Brett. Thank Hi, you so Alice. much for that very questionable descriptor. I you am know, people not ho- just really didn't like homely. They really got upset with it about that. Well, so they should. Make sure Thank let everybody you for know all that you. was just a, That was kidding. Thank you for I really, defending I my it honor, friends. And I am kind of homely because I just invited Brett to my home, and he's like, I really don't want to. So I don't I know. Is this, is this the beginning of the end? I'm. I'm <laughs> definitely. I am coming to your house tomorrow, Alice. I will be there with bells on and children. Maybe I don't want you to come anymore. I don't want you to have to hang out with me. Well, then I'll just go to the pool. That's fine. <laughs> Guys, this is a fantastic episode already because Brett has been like traveling the world for the last, I don't know, seven days, eight days. I have slept none of those days. So I feel like this episode can only be fantastic. And because we're talking about a timeline, I have no concept of time anymore, ever. I don't know if I'll ever have a concept of time again. I've kind of hit that stage in the newborn phase where like time has no meaning Nothing has meaning. I can't, I don't, I don't feel anything. So we're going to need this timeline to bring me back to reality. Exactly. And, and while we're on the subject of timelines, and another thing about time, we're recording this live with our patrons and we always set these things for like, in this case, 830 Central Standard Time, actually Central Daylight Time. And the number of people who cannot convert time zones, like people are literally ask me like, what time is that Eastern which always blows my mind and tells me that you guys didn't watch broadcast television growing up or sports because they always say 7 Central, 8 Eastern, right? It's one hour after Central. It is just, it, it's amazing. It's it, seriously, every time we do this, multiple people will ask, what time is that in Eastern time? You know and what, I Brett? Just, we can't have all gone it. to Harvard, so cut people Look, a little slack. You know, we have these magic boxes that we carry around with us everywhere that will tell you what time it is in Eastern time. And not that I mind answering. It's just, it, it's, it's one of those things that, that I'm always constantly You guys are getting to by. see the real Brett. He won't come to my house when invited and then says that he never hangs out with me. And then he makes fun of you guys for not knowing simple math, which is really hard for a lot of people. I feel you. I am defending all of you. So, Brett, you know what? 
it's okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna start doing Zulu time from now on. There's Zulu time. Everybody's just gonna have to do the math, unless you live in Greenwich, England. That's what you're gonna have to do. Anyways, oh, okay. We've been a little let's, bit Let's get to today. real time. Speaking of time, real time. Time this is, is of our, the essence. Time is of the essence. That's right. Alice's baby is asleep, so we gotta get this. Gotta get this in. And we are up to January 14th in this timeline in the Heyman Lee case. You know, one thing I want to say about the timeline, we've now done, I guess, three and a half episodes on timelines in this case. And there are people, and you hear this a lot in this case, who just question whether or not you can even have a timeline in this case. How can you know when anything happened? And to me, there is this tendency when people talk about this case to act like it's different in some way than any other case timelines are always number one hard number two squishy number three impossible to know in in total and all you can do is look at what you do know and use that to build as much of a timeline as you have and in this case we have various people saying various things we have cell phone calls we have some cell phone pings, which are, you know, helpful to a certain extent. So this timeline, there is a notion of it's impossible to have a timeline in this case. That's not true. And we've laid out a timeline and, and there are things in it that may not be entirely accurate. And as we've gone through, we've noted for you when people say this happened at six, but then you look at the telephone calls and you realize eh, probably 530 or probably 615. You know, we've attempted to do that, but I just, I want to disabuse people of this notion that it's impossible to know when anything happened in this case. Absolutely. And that's not unique to this case as well. In every case that we do both on the podcast and cases that we prosecute or litigate, timelines are squishy. And that's why you use kind of what people's memories are. Remember, we've talked about firsthand knowledge. Firsthand knowledge is almost always squishy because we view the world through a lens and then we pair it with hard evidence that we know from security cameras, from timestamps, from cell phone pings to be able to kind of corroborate slash hone in on the timeline. And so not only is this not unique to this case, but this is how we build a timeline in every single case. And also remember, obviously we're not accounting for every second of every day of everyone who may be involved here. And so there's selectivity with a timeline and not everything within the timeline may ultimately be important. And also some important things may be left out of the timeline. And that is how investigators view cases as well. We don't have perfect information and that's why investigators have a job, right? So just know that just don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Just because we may not know the specificity to the second of every single entry does not mean there isn't a timeline or not a trustworthy timeline that can help us frame and understand what is happening. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's dive back into the timeline. And we're in January 14th now. As we said a couple episodes ago, the ice storm that's been coming has now struck the area. On January 13th, it was 58 degrees. It was a nice, wonderful day, particularly in January in Baltimore. But on the 14th, it's a high of 35 and a low of 21. And a lot of areas are having a lot of problems with ice. Those of you who live in the Northeast know ice storms are worse than snowstorms, but eventually they can manage it a little bit better. So it's not like the whole place is locked down, but it is the case that schools are canceled and there are a lot of people who don't have power. At 1.30 a.m. that morning, Officer Adcock speaks to Don Clendenst, who is Hay's boyfriend, and Don tells him that he last spoke to Hay on the 12th. And that seems to be consistent with that telephone call they had the night before. This is pretty late when they finally talk. There are people who think this is significant, particularly people who want to point to Don. What seems to be pretty clear is Don gets home. He eventually gets a call from Lens Crafters about this. He kind of plays phone tag with Adcock. He calls him. Adcock eventually calls him back, and Adcock will even say the reason they talk, he spoke to him so late, he's doing a bunch of other stuff, and he finally gets back in touch with Don at 1.30, but it, there's nothing about this that seems like he's dodging the police officers or you know he's off you know, doing whatever, burying hay or whatnot at this time. It just seems like it took a while for the police officer to get in touch with him. Don doesn't have a whole lot to offer. He doesn't really know anything. All he knows is he talked to Hay the night before. And remember, with respect to how late this is, at this point, all they know is that Hay is missing. And so every passing hour, every minute matters if she is kidnapped or if she is in the element and needs to be helped. Every hour could mean life or death. And so I could imagine Officer Adcock basically telling Don, call me back no matter the hour. I'm going to be on this until dawn. And Don himself, if 
he this is the first he's hearing about it. He's also has an interest in making sure if Hay is in danger that he offers all the information he can so that she can be found. So the time here is actually pretty consistent with a missing person case. So at around 1230 that day, though, this is one of those times it could have been any time. Jennifer picks Jay up again and they go to the dumpster behind the F&M store where he throws his clothes and boots he was wearing the night before away. Jay is, at this point, pretty paranoid about someone finding out about this. As we said, at some point the night before, he goes back to one of the dumpsters where the the shovels were, and he wipes his fingerprints off. And just in case his fingerprints are on the shovels, he wipes those off. So they are very much in the cover-up mode. At this point, it's interesting that Jennifer is with him so much. I'm going to talk about that more later. Jennifer is opening herself up to some criminal liability by some of the things she does. Jay's obviously very deep into that as well. At 8 o'clock that night, Adnan will lead prayers at the mosque. On January 15th, Adnan attends a party at the Liberty Fire Hall. This party was hosted by Krista Meyer's parents. Crystal will later tell police that Adnan did not seem all that concerned about Hayes' disappearance, but instead appeared to have a carefree attitude. So moving forward about a week on January 21st, Adnan calls Jay no fewer than three times. Now, this is somewhat unusual as Adnan had not called Jay between the murder and this day. So basically, they were together a lot on January 13th. Then the communication between them was silent until January 21st. The next day, January 22nd, police talked to Don, Hay's boyfriend, again. Don said Hay was generally happy about their relationship, although she had fought with her mother about breaking curfew and her phone privileges. But Don also added that he did not think Hay would run away because of those situations. Don said that Hay was supposed to call him when she left work on January 13th, sometime after 10 p.m., but of course, she never did. On January 25th, the track team drives through Leakin Park on the way to a tournament. And one of Adnan's teammates actually mentions that people dump bodies in Leakin Park. This contrasts with the notion that Adnan would have no idea where Leakin Park was or what it was used for. I mean, this is a very, clearly they're not thinking about, hey, at this point, it's just They're driving through Leakin Park, and we have areas like that where we live, where when you drive past, you're like, dude, they dump bodies here. But of course, you know, later on, Adnan will say, I had no idea that that would be a dumping ground for bodies to cover up murders. And the fact that someone just mentions it offhand here goes to the fact that he probably heard it. He probably knew this. It was probably well known to, you know, the high schoolers in this area. So people talk about how much Jay lies. Adnan lies all the time. And he may lie for the same reasons Jay does, to protect himself, to separate himself from this crime he's not involved in, to protect other people. There's all sorts of reasons he may do it, but he lies all the time. One thing he lies about is that he didn't know where Leakin Park was or the people dumped bodies in it. There is no way, there is no way that you would you would go to high school a mile away from a place where bodies have been turning up for 100 years, including serial killers are dumping bodies there, and not know about it. I mean, come on. Everybody in town would talk about that. He clearly knew about it. It's another lie he tells. Does it show that he's guilty? No, but I just think it's worth pointing out that a lot of people lie in this case, and it's not just Jay. Yeah, that's a great point. And police talked to Adnan on January 25th, and he said he saw Hay in class and that he was at track practice after school and did not see Hay leave school. He noted that the school was closed for bad weather on January 14th and 15th, which is true. And he told police that he and Hay ended their relationship over, quote, religious differences. He said they never told their parents about the relationship because they knew they'd disapprove But this isn't entirely true, as we've spoken about in previous episodes. Young Lee, Hay's brother, testified that the family did know about their relationship, and Adnan even came into the store that his mother owned, both with and without Hay. In fact, Hay's mom wanted to meet Adnan's parents because she wanted to meet, you know, the boyfriend's family, but that was impossible. And it's clear that Hay did keep the extent of the relationship from her family, but It's not like she kept the relationship completely from her family. Her diary makes clear that she's lying about the relationship to some extent, but the dynamic is not quite the mirror image that Adnan makes it out to be. As we've already seen, Adnan's parents, you know, make a public scene about the fact that he's in a relationship with Hay. 
No such thing from her family. Adnan described himself as good friends with Hay and said he had no idea where she was. He also told police he did not know Hay had a boyfriend, which we obviously know is plainly false and contradicted by him telling Adcock to talk to her boyfriend, among other things. So even just a few days after her disappearance, Adnan is changing his story and he's saying inconsistent things to the same officer even, which is sloppy, but also not uncommon, right? He's already talked to the police. The first time he talks, he's kind of caught off guard and he spouts off things. Go talk to the boyfriend. I don't know. Hey, he was supposed to give me a ride. He didn't have time to think about his story. But once time is moving on and he knows that the police are asking questions, Hey still hasn't turned up, that he is coming under some scrutiny, he's had time to think about his story and think about how to change it to best fit whatever alibi he wants. And that's why we're seeing the changes later on. If he's trying to come up with an alibi because it seems like it's too short of a time for memories to have shifted at this point. We're only talking about a week or so after the first time he talked to Adcock. So it's very suspect that his story is changing, if not for some reason. Now, it could be, again, just distancing himself, recognizing that he's very close to Hay and therefore probably high on the suspect list. But I don't think the changes are due to lapses in memory due to how close in time he's talking to the police. And this is one of those examples of how serial kind of misleads you at the beginning, right? I mean, this whole notion of how could anybody remember anything six weeks after it happened? I mean, this, number one, he talked to the police that night. Number two, this conversation, like Alice said, is only a couple weeks, less than two weeks after she disappeared. He isn't, he hasn't already forgotten, you know, that he asked her for a ride or that kind of thing. He hasn't already forgotten that he knew she had a boyfriend. And the other thing about this, a couple more lies here, a lot about the relationship, knowledge of Hay's parents about the relationship and lies about knowing that she had a boyfriend. And as I said, there's reasons you lie other than you're guilty of killing someone. The one thing that's a little weird about this, we don't know that she's dead yet. She's only been missing for 12 days, and the going theory is she ran away to California. That's what everybody will say. That's what he will say. Wasn't really worried about her because just assumed she ran off to California. If that's true, there's less reason for him to lie about potentially incriminating things for innocent reasons. People lie about incriminating things. An innocent reason people lie about criminal things is because they're innocent. <laughs> they do it all the time. And in fact, it gets people in a lot of trouble when they are innocent and lie about things that the police are then like, oh, oh. So you said you weren't in the area that night, and you were. And you're like, well, of course I said I wasn't there because I didn't want you to think I killed anybody because I didn't, and you get in trouble. But here, the justification for lying is a little bit is a little bit more suspect than, than maybe if this had happened after Hay's body had been found. Okay, so that brings us to January 26th. This is another day that Adnan would call Jay. He calls him at 6.37 p.m., and they talk for a minute and 49 seconds. And really quick, just remember that he's calling Jay now the day after he's spoken to the police yet again, right? And so there's kind of been no conversation between them and then he talks to the Adnan talks to the police and we have this call with Jay. And the relationship between Jay and Adnan is one of the most interesting things and and it cuts both ways because people will say that they weren't close. We've said, it seems like they were closer than people say. But Jay has said they were just acquaintances. They weren't friends. He'll testify to that. When he testifies at trial, he says, yeah, you know, we hung out every now and then. <sighs> How does this cut? On the one hand, you would think they'd need to be pretty close for Adnan to rely on him after a murder. On the other hand, if they weren't that close, it is strange that Adnan talked to him so much on the day that Hay went missing. Like Alice said, just so happens to call him after he talks to the police and we're going to see some, some more interactions between them. You know, if they're not close, why are they talking so much? So maybe they're closer than, than either one of them wants to admit, even if Jay and Adnan had nothing to do with Hayes' murder. So that's 637. Jay talks to Adnan. At 1025, Jennifer and Jay are pulled over. Jennifer is driving. Jay, and never do this if you're the passenger, keeps making sort of suspicious movements towards the center console which will always make the police both nervous about you and suspicious of you. And so they ask him to exit the vehicle, which is a pretty common thing to do for officer safety. Over the intervening minutes, Jay will get more and more hostile with the police until the police finally place him under arrest. Jay fights back, and he and the officers end up on the ground. Jay is arrested and early the next morning charged with disorderly conduct 
and are resisting arrest. Jay will later tell the story to the police, as a matter of fact, when they ask him, why didn't you come to us? After he tells a story about Adnan murdering Hay, like, why didn't you come to us? And he says, look, man, I get, I get harassed by the police all the time. I've gotten beaten up by the police before. And I think this is a situation where he would present this as this is excess force by the police against, you know, a black man in Baltimore in the 1990s. And that's how he would put it. The police would say, no, he was aggressive. He was hostile. We took him down and we arrested him. And that was appropriate. What's interesting though, is what happens the next day. So that's late at night on the 26th. And Jay is being sort of booked and processed through that morning. On January 27th, the next day at 4.44 p.m., Adnan makes a call to Patrick that pings the Leakin Park cell tower. This is the only call other than those the night of the murders that ever pings that tower. Interestingly, the Patrick that Adnan is calling is the same Patrick from the day of the murders. This is the guy that apparently is a marijuana dealer who was friends with Jay and much better friends with Jay than Adnan. And as far as anybody can tell, Jay is the one who bought the marijuana, not Adnan. So two possibilities spring to mind, particularly if Adnan is guilty. One, Jay may have told him he didn't want anything to do with Adnan anymore and he could buy his own weed. And this is just an example of Adnan calling Patrick to set up some sort of buy when he just so happens to be passing through Leakin Park. And remember, this is an outgoing call, and outgoing calls, as opposed to incoming calls, tend to be accepted as more reliable. But the second and more interesting possibility is that Adnan is calling one of Jay's friends to find out why Jay got arrested. The call lasts 12 seconds, and you can imagine, he's calling a friend to find out why Jay's arrested, He is driving through Leakin Park. Why would he be driving through Leakin Park? He wants to see whether or not the police are there. He wants to see whether or not there's a crime scene. He wants to see whether or not Hayes' body has been found, and that's why he's making this phone call. According to Jay, he will say that Adnan will later come by the video store where he worked and asked him to go back to the side of the burial and help him cover up the body more but Jay refused. That second one takes into account a lot of things, right? We've all been in those situations where if Jay's getting arrested, word travels fast. And you can imagine why Adnan would be calling Jay's friend as opposed to anyone closer to Jay because he might be afraid that maybe Jay's phone is tapped or that people are watching Jay's house or he he just wants to know basically how nervous he should be if he is guilty. And that's especially interesting with the whole the location of the call coming coming from Leakin Park. Like you said, Brett, we know that many people who commit crimes like to go back to the crime scene to see everything that they did unfold, usually with murders, with arsons, that sort of thing. They show up in search parties if there's a missing person because there's some kind of joy they get from seeing the immense scene that they are the cause of. Now, in this case, I don't know that if Adnan were guilty, he's going back to kind of revel in that sort of thing. I think he's a nervous kid. And he just heard that his friend who was with him the day that the murder happened, or the disappearance happened, has been arrested. And he's making sure he doesn't have to like run or flee. And so he's trying to figure out how much the police know by driving through Leakin Park. So I give you I give an example from my own life of a similar situation. Not after I you know, was accused of murdering somebody. But when I was in college, it was a college story. Everybody loves these. I'll try to keep it short. When I was in college, you know, I lived in a dorm room, and there was this, it looked like a yellow A. That's the best way I can describe it. It was a yellow wooden A, and we used it to hold open our door. So we had a door that opened to a suite, had four guys who lived there. We'd hold open the door with it so people you know, could come and go and see us. So one day I'm walking down the hall towards my room and there's a police officer and the RA standing at the door and I'm just like hey guys how's it going and they're like are you not curious why we're here <laughs> and I said I just thought you were hanging out and they said where where did this come from and they point to the A well it turned out that the A was not actually an A it was actually one of the sides of like a sawhorse like a police barricade, and apparently someone had stolen it. They had somehow gotten that thing and stolen it and taken it to our room. And I was like, I have no idea. (laughs) I have no idea where this thing came from. It's just always been here. And it had. And the RA was like, yeah, actually, it's always been here. It's been here since the first day uh, that we moved in. 
and and they're like okay that's fine so the so they they kind of move on well i immediately go downstairs to the class that i know my roommate is in and i call him out of class i interrupt the class and i call him out of class and i get him out and i'm like dude do you know anything about that because the cops were just up there and he's like i don't know anything about it and he goes back in well the police smart smart police that they are they also went down to my roommate's class and specifically asked if i had come by to ask for my roommate and then they came back and found me and they were like so why were you talking to your roommate and i I said i just wanted to know if he knew anything about it and they were like oh yeah you guys weren't you guys weren't trying to get your story straight i was like no we weren't trying to get our story straight but to me and we never figured out what the cop basically took it and like left it somewhere in the hopes that somebody would find it because he was friendly to us. Somebody would find it and it wouldn't be a big deal. So instead of writing it up or anything, he literally just like left it in a parking lot. Anyway, point being, that's the kind of thing you do when someone thinks you might be guilty of something and you're like trying to figure out what in the world's going on here. And here, obviously Adnan doesn't know if he's innocent, he doesn't know that her body's in Lincoln Park. So if he's innocent, he'd have no reason to go there. But if he's guilty, he would have every reason to go there because he hears that Jay's been arrested. And the first thing that goes through his mind is, oh my God, they know, right? They know. And so he, he drives out there. He's calling Patrick to find out, like, have you heard anything? Do you know why Jay's been arrested? He gets out to Lincoln Park and there's nobody there. And you can only imagine if he's guilty, how much relief would have flooded through him, though it also would have made him probably think things like, I need to talk to Jay. We need to do a better job making sure that body's never found. And so that would be consistent with him going to talk to Jay later. As a matter of fact, that's not the last phone call he makes. Only five minutes later, he calls Patrick again. This call lasts 39 seconds. Now, it pings the tower that covers the location of Hayes' car, though it's actually Sector C of that tower, which is the area just west of where the car is. That's the same, the same area of the burial site. And this is the thing about cell phones. We've talked about this before, about how cell phones might ping different towers. And so some people are like, well, you know, how much can you really trust the towers? That's one reason the sector is so important. Because generally speaking, if your phone is going to ping a different tower, it's going to ping a tower that also covers where you're at. Pretty much everywhere you are, particularly in a city, is going to be covered by multiple cell phone towers. So it's not so much that your cell phone is going to ping, you know, a cell phone tower in Washington, D.C. It's going to ping another tower that might not be quite as good, but that's also going to cover it. So a couple things you can imagine here, if Adnan's guilty, so he drives through Leakin Park, and he heads towards that tower that also happens to cover Hayes' car. He checks on the car, make sure the car's still there. He then turns around and he's going back, back towards his house, back towards his mosque, back towards Woodlawn High School. And as he's going back through, he's calling Patrick again about five minutes after that initial call. I think that's pretty much, if he's guilty, what would have happened here. And the next call he's going to make is to Jay. And here, this makes sense, right? If you are not sure if you can talk to Jay, because if Jay is with the police, if he's been tapped, whatever, it makes sense that you would talk to his friend first and maybe Patrick can give him the intel like, hey, he's out, he's home, you can you can give him a call. That would make more sense because he's obviously called Jay more times than Patrick. The only other time Patrick's been called was really Jay calling Patrick with Adnan there. And so Adnan doesn't really have any reason to call Patrick unless to make sure it's okay to call Jay. And that's just because of the relationship or the lack of relationship that we know exists between Adnan and Patrick. So I'm not surprised that Jay's phone call follows basically two calls to Patrick, who knows Jay a lot better and can give Adnan the all clear, like, it's okay, you can give him a call. So at 517, Adnan calls Jay. They talk for two minutes and 18 seconds, and the cell phone by this point is back up near Woodlawn High. That's the, that's the tower that it's pinging. Interestingly, at 11.05 that night, Adnan calls Stephanie. This is Jay's girlfriend. They talk for two minutes and 49 seconds. Recall, Stephanie and Adnan are close, so ordinarily it might not be that strange that they would talk. It's interesting they don't talk very long. So not entirely clear what they're talking about. And Stephanie is kind of a black box on a lot of this stuff. I mean, some of the stuff she says is is pretty damning for Adnan, but she's not very clear on a lot of things. And as far as I know, we don't know what she says their conversation was about. And obviously Adnan would tell you, look, it's just another phone call. All these are just phone calls. I don't know. I was just calling people I like. 
So unclear who it is, but once again, on this day, the day after Jay is arrested, the day that Adnan is in Leakin Park with his cell phone, he's calling Patrick twice, Jay, and Stephanie. Now that's really interesting, right? When we have Adnan later on saying that he is not so close to Jay, but we have basically all his calls on this day, January 27th, around Jay, or J, it's to Jay or Jay adjacent. And obviously we know he has the relationship with Stephanie, but it's just really interesting to have such tight concentric circles around someone, but later on say that you're not as close to them as you clearly are. Now on January 28th, Jennifer tells her friend Nicole Parks that she knew Hay had been strangled and she knew who did it. Remember, this is before Hay's body is found. They are at the 7-Eleven on Frederick Road when she has this heart to heart with Nicole. At 2.13, Adnan calls Jay at home, but the call is only 13 seconds long. On January 31st, Adnan calls Jay at, get this, 9.06 a.m., 9.07, 10.15, 10.24, and 5.48 p.m., 5.51 p.m., 5.55 p.m. So that's seven calls that day, and they come in two spurts at the beginning of the day and near the end of the work day. That's a lot of calls to Jay, and we haven't seen that flurry of calls to Jay previously. On February 1st, 1999, Officer O'Shea, who had interviewed Adnan on January 25th, followed up with him because he'd looked at Adcock's reports and noticed that Adnan had said on the day that Hay disappeared, he was supposed to get a ride with her. So basically... O'Shea wouldn't have known this inconsistency at the time he spoke to Adnan, but he did what he was supposed to do, which is compare the previous report of Adnan speaking to the police with what Adnan told him on the 25th. And he confronts Adnan and says, hey, that, this isn't true. He said that he drove his own car to school and wouldn't have needed a ride. The officer worked to have an in-person meeting with Adnan, but Adnan wanted this meeting to be with his brother, not his parents, due to their strict beliefs. And this is probably because he's only 17 at this time, and so he's a minor. And they would say that, you know, we want to have this conversation with your parents. He doesn't want his parents involved. He wants his brother there. So the meeting is set up for February 10th, but... It's ultimately canceled when Hay's body is found. O'Shea had been in close contact with Hope Schwab. She was a teacher at their school, and he'd actually given Hope a list of about four to five questions that she could ask reluctant students and teachers to get more information about Adnan and Hay. Hope then gave them to Debbie to answer, and Debbie put these questions in her planner. Adnan borrowed Debbie's planner, not once, but twice. And when he gave the planner back to Debbie, the questions that Hope had given her to answer were gone. And later on, if there was any doubt where those questions went, Adnan actually confronts Hope about asking questions of teachers and students about him. So it seems clear that he's the reason those questions are gone, or at the very least, he saw those questions and wanted to know what was going on and what the police knew and why Hope was helping the police ask students and teachers questions. And all this is going to be testified about at the trial. And yeah, look, I mean, none of these facts are good for Adnan. We, get, we go back to Officer O'Shea. Adnan appears to be lying to him about asking for the ride. I mean, there's just, I can think of no reason that multiple people have said Adnan asked for a ride, including Adnan, and he have not asked for a ride. Once again, he could be changing his story because he's worried, because he's concerned. He thinks they're looking at him. But once again, we don't know. It's just, it conflicts with this whole notion that until they found her body, nobody really was worried about, hey, that's what Adnan will tell you. There was no reason for me to remember things. There was no reason for this day to be significant because as far as I knew, she just ran off to California. Well, that doesn't jive with him lying to these police officers because out of his concern that they're going to think he's guilty of something he didn't do. He lies about this. He lies about asking her for a ride. The other thing he lies about is that he had his car that day. Once again, this is not that long after she's gone missing. At this point, we're up to 18 days. Jay had his car that day. He would not have forgotten that. He would not have forgotten that he let Jay borrow his car on the day that she went missing. It's just not something he would forget. It would have been... Even if he forgot a lot of things that day, he would have remembered, if he's telling the truth, that when Officer Adcock called him, when a police officer called him to ask him about his ex-girlfriend, Jay was sitting right next to him. 
They were driving the car. Not only was Jay sitting right next to him, but according to Adnan, he reached across Jay to get his phone out of the glove compartment. So he wouldn't have forgotten that. So he's lying about that too. He's lying about having his car that day. And then you have this interaction with Debbie and, and Hope. And, and maybe at this point, Adnan is starting to feel the pressure. And he's starting to feel like the police are on top of him. And he thought Hope was a friend. And he doesn't know why she's doing this to him. There are explanations for that. And I'm sure that's what he would say. But nevertheless, he's not... He's young, he's 17, he's doing dumb things. He's doing dumb things either because he's a dumb 17-year-old or because he is guilty and he is attempting to hide that fact. By February 2nd, Jay supposedly tells his friend Chris that Adnan killed Hay. Chris will later say that Jay told him the whole story about a week before Hay's body was found, which is around this time. And Jay apparently told Chris that Adnan killed Hay at the library. This story that Jay tells Chris is interesting for one important reason. If you think that the 247 call is the come get me call, then it has to be something like this. It has to be Adnan didn't kill her at the Best Buy. He might have met Jay at the Best Buy, but he'd actually killed her at the library. And remember... The library fits into this because that's where Asia McLean's going to say she saw him. That's where people tended to meet each other when they had a ride. That was a popular place to meet somebody for a ride. It was a library because it was right next door to the school. But it's sort of out of the way of all the buses and the people picking people up and all that stuff. So you kind of walk next door to the library, you get in the car and drive off. If this story is true, then maybe as much as we said there's no way that 247 call has anything to do with the murder, or at least is the come pick me up call. If this is true, maybe maybe that's what happened. The problem with Jay, once again, he's all over the place with this stuff. I just don't put a lot of stock into Jay about when and where Adnan killed Hay because I don't think Jay was with him. So I think at best, it's Jay retelling the story that Adnan told him. So at this point, you've got like double hearsay. You got Chris telling you what Jay told him that was told to Jay by Adnan. But it's worth mentioning not only because it's an early instance of Jay apparently telling someone other than Jennifer Poose Terry about this, but also because it opens the, the barest window for maybe the, the prosecution's timeline to actually be correct. Another thing that happens on February 2nd is at 6.01 p.m., Adnan calls Jay. February 3rd, the next day, Adnan calls Jay twice. Then we come to February 9th, 1999. Before we get to this day, though, you know, a lot of you may be thinking, why would uh, the double hearsay thing, why would Jay tell somebody else, especially if Jay could be implicated in some sort of criminal activity that Adnan killed Hay? Remember, we've talked about this, that conspiracies, whenever there's more than one person involved in any criminal enterprise, any criminal activity, it is so difficult to keep that secret because we as relational beings want to get things off our chest, whether because we feel feel guilt, whether because we want to brag or we just want to make conversation. Like it's the most exciting thing that's happened to me all year. I'm going to talk about it. It's really hard. And think about your instances in your own life. You may be divulging kind of your innermost thoughts to some people that you may not even be that close to because we all have kind of a false sense of security when we speak to someone. We think that when we say something generally, even though we know it's not true in our head, in our hearts, most of us think that when we speak something, it's because it's a safe place. Otherwise, you wouldn't say it right? If you do not feel safe saying something, you will not say it. And we as relational beings are just, we want to say things. That's what makes us relational beings and not animals. We communicate with our words and we want to be communicating. And this example of Jay telling Jen Pusateri, telling Chris, whether what he says is true or not, these instances are incredibly believable, even if Jay has criminal liability here that you would say something like that. And that's why if you're going to commit a crime, don't involve anybody else. Yeah. You know, as we've said before, two people can keep a secret if one of them's dead. You know, you might wonder why would you involve somebody else here? I mean, I think the simplest answer is Adnan's plan, if he did it, would have depended on having two cars because he's got to get Hay's car away and then he's got to get away from Hay's car. So I think there was sort of a, he needed a getaway driver. He needed someone to help him stash the car. He probably felt like he needed somebody to help him bury her body too. And I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting question, but definitely if he's guilty, if he's not, Jay's involvement is, is a, 
is what will end up damning him, right? I mean, Jay is the one who's going to bring it all together for the police at some point. So February 9th, 1999, at 1.30 p.m., Coppin State Police informed the Baltimore Police Department that an employee, Alonzo Sellers, has found a body in Leakin Park. At 1.45, investigators arrive at the 4400 block of North Franklin Town Road, and they are brought to the partially buried remains of a female, and it is Hay. Either that night or the next day, Jennifer Pusateri hears that a body has been found in Leakin Park, and she tells a group of friends that if the person was strangled, she bets it's Hay. So here we have kind of more hearsay, right? This basically at least corroborates the fact that Jen heard something about Hay's murder. The fact that she is saying something to other people. Her knowledge is also third hand, but she is at least showing her state of knowledge, whether it's true or not. And so this is why it's helpful to have other people's testimony, because one person, maybe not enough, but if you have like two or three people saying, oh, yeah, Jen definitely mentioned something about the way that Hay died, indicates that there's more likelihood that she did, in fact, hear that from somebody. Now, on February 10th, 1999, police request an hourly broadcast via citywide channel for Hayes vehicle, because at this point, even though her body's recovered, they have not been able to locate her car. In the request, they note that finding the vehicle is critical to the investigation. And we're going to read to you this part of their broadcast to the city. The vehicle is described as a 1998 Nissan Sentra, four-door sedan gray in color, the VIN number, Maryland registration, and that in handwriting it says stolen on January 13th, 1999 course, the day that Hay disappeared. If the vehicle is located, immediately contact the homicide unit, hold all occupants and await the arrival of a homicide investigator or supervisor. In all caps, do not take any other action unless ordered to do so. At 10 p.m., Krista calls Aisha and Aisha tells her that Hay is dead. Krista asks if anyone has told Adnan. She says no and Aisha and asks her to do it. Both Young Lee and Krista actually call Adnan to tell him that Hay is dead. Adnan, upon hearing this, goes to Aisha's, and Krista and Stephanie are also at Aisha's house. Yeah, there's this is interesting. Obviously, this is the day that the body is found. The car bulletin. This is not the first time the Baltimore police have attempted to find this car, but at this point, with a body, they recognize just how important it is. And you start seeing these bulletins go out to every officer in Baltimore. Look for this car. We have to find this car. Because there's going to be a lot of evidence in there. And you're going to see that a lot. Why is this important? It's important because, number one, it's standard operating procedure. It's exactly what you'd expect to see. Number two, it involves the entire Baltimore Police Department in trying to find the car. Number three, later on, people are going to say that the police always knew where the car was and that they were going to use it to frame Adnan by letting Jay know where it was so he could lead them to it. And that's sort of the theory about, when you ask the question, how did Jay know where the car was? Because he's the one who's going to take him to it. The answer you're typically given is, well, the police told him. So if you believe that, then you have to believe that a lot of this is window dressing. A lot of this is a cover-up. You have to believe that the car is sitting there, and that the police, even though they know where it is, they're continuing to ask people about it. The problem here is... If they're holding that car with the idea of framing someone down the road, it's really dangerous to ask every police officer in Baltimore to be looking for it. So what if one of them finds it and they call it in? And then you're like, ah, now our plan to frame someone is lost. Now we're going to have to go get that car that might have all the evidence in there. So it's a little strange. It is something that people will say to you if you ask them how Jay knew where the car was. And this is just the first instance of... And it's not even the first, but it's the first sort of instance after her body was found of a real attempt to buy the police to find the car. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Brett. If you buy into a police conspiracy of planting evidence or feeding evidence to Jay or any party to frame someone, typically there's not enough. Remember, we talked about conspiracies. It's not going to be a conspiracy across the entire police force. Usually it's going to be like one or two if it actually exists and 
there are instances, of course, where there is police corruption, but police corruption is typically among like one or two bad eggs. It is not the entire department because there are too many structures in place to prevent them from getting away with something like that. So note that when, you know, someone has a police corruption conspiracy theory, it's it has to be a police corruption conspiracy of a couple people, not the entire police department, because those are just so hard to pull off, especially in this instance. And basically alerting all the other people who could thwart your plan is very risky and something you would really want to avoid. Yeah, and it's like any other conspiracy. It's not like police don't like to talk. They do. You know, and the more police officers are involved in your conspiracy, the more likely somebody's going to be like, well, I knew where the car was the whole time. I don't know why they didn't look for it. You know, so, you know. We're going to talk a lot more about this. It's not the last time we're going to talk about this, but it's something to remember and something to note. February 11th, 1999, at 8 a.m., Adnan will meet with Sharon Watts, who is the school counselor. She sets up a counseling room for the kids on this day to talk about hay and to talk about you know what they're, what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And she will later describe Adnan as appearing to be in shock in a daze. He said he thought that they had it all wrong. He said that all Asians look alike, and it wasn't hey that they had made a mistake. According to her, Adnan cried a good bit. But then something weird happens, according to Watts. Adnan kind of shifts. And in fact, Watts will later testify that Adnan appears insincere to her and fake about his emotions. She will also say that he told her that the last time he talked to hey, she asked if they'd ever get back together, and he said no. This is the same story that Becky, we mentioned earlier, Becky White, I believe is her last name, would testify to at trial. Watts thought this was very unusual. It is unusual. And this is the second person who says that on that phone call the night before she went missing, when she was on the phone with Dawn and leaves that flowery message in her diary, that Adnan told them that in that call, hey, asked him if they would ever get back together, and he said no. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence, no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project, whether you've got a hundred year old house like I do, or it seems like things are always breaking, or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving, installations or cleaning, Angie is there for you and they're there for you with confidence. So Angie has over 20 years of home service experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process bring them your project online or with angie's app answer a few questions and angie can handle the rest from start to finish or they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps because when it comes to getting the most out of your home you can do this when you angie that Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Check them out today. Angie.com. A-N-G-I dot com. Alice, it's time to talk about one of our favorite sponsors, HelloFresh. It's hot outside and it's time to take a bite out of summer with HelloFresh. From chef-crafted seasonal recipes to the new fresh and fit summer menu, HelloFresh brings flavor right to your door. We're all busy people. We don't have a lot of time. But you want to eat well this summer and it is time to try HelloFresh. Did you know that HelloFresh offers more than just delicious dinners? It's now easier than ever to skip that extra grocery store run by adding snacks, sides, and more to your weekly order. Simply shop HelloFresh Market and take your pick from a curated selection of over 100 items. And if you're looking to eat well this summer and maybe lose a little weight, I could use that. HelloFresh's menu features calorie smart and protein smart lunch and dinner options, plus new vegan dinners to choose from. HelloFresh makes it easy to reach your food goals with flavorful recipes that leave you feeling satisfied. 
Brett, I think everyone knows because I always talk about how busy I am and how difficult it is to feed my very hungry family, but not with HelloFresh. It is so easy not to use my brain to have to think about meal planning. It's great to have these groceries delivered right to me and a beautiful menu all planned out for me. My kids seriously love HelloFresh. They know the logo, they know the box, and they clap with excitement when they see a HelloFresh package come out for dinner. Come join us and see why we're so excited about HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com slash TP50 and use code TP50 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash TP50 and use code TP50 for 50% off plus free shipping. And find out for yourself why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Brett, before we move on, have you ever been on the hunt for a new doctor and you ask literally everyone you know for their recs? You know, a doctor who actually gets you, listens to you, and makes you feel super comfortable. And after weeks of searching, you finally find the one. Not only are they close by, but they have everything you've been looking for in a doctor. So you call their office and they have an appointment available. Heck yeah. But then the receptionist tells you this perfect doctor doesn't take your insurance. Wipe your tears away, put away the ice cream, and head over to ZocDoc to find and book the doctor who is right for you and takes your insurance. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top-rated patient-reviewed doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones who take your insurance are located near you and treat almost any condition you're searching for. And Alice, these docs all have verified reviews from actual real patients, not bots. The average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc is between just 24 to 48 hours. That's it. You can even score same-day appointments. Once you find the doc you want, you can book them immediately with just a few app taps. No more waiting awkwardly on the phone with a receptionist. I'm actually looking for a doctor right now, getting a little bit older, kind of need one. And I went to ZocDoc and was surprised to see the doctor's pop-up that took my insurance. It makes it so easy to find a new doctor. So go to ZocDoc.com slash prosecutors and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc, Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash prosecutors. ZocDoc dot com slash prosecutors. The Prosecutors Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, guys, whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, price and coverage match limited by state law. Right, exactly. So obviously we don't have Hay telling us what happened in that phone call, but we have her writing and her words, and her words seem pretty unequivocally in love with Don and not Adnan. And so, you know, seems to me unlikely their conversation was in that order. More likely, Adnan asking if they'd get back together. And hey, having made her relationship with Don incredibly public, remember on her AIM chat profile that she was just over the moon with Don, that she was actually asking Adnan if they'd get back together. So on February 12th, 1999, 15 police officers spend the day canvassing Baltimore for Hay's car. Once again, these, these officers are assigned to do this. It is a top priority for the investigators. At 3.19 p.m. on that day, an anonymous caller, who the officer will describe as an Asian male, though later on at trial will be described as someone sounding as though they may be Indian. And this is, you know, Asian. I think a lot of people, when you think of Asian, you think of Japan, you think of China. But obviously, Asia is a big continent, and it seems like this officer actually meant more the subcontinent of Asia, which would include India and Pakistan. 
This person calls the police, and he says they sound like they're a young person, and they tell them they should focus on Adnan Syed. According to the caller, Leakin Park was somewhere that Adnan and Hay had had sex in the past, but she had broken up with him and broken off the relationship about a week before she was murdered. The police attempt to trace the call, but they're unable to do so as the number was not in the service area. A few minutes later, six minutes later, as a matter of fact, the caller calls back. And they say that about a year before, Adnan had told a friend of his, Yasser Ali, that if he ever did anything to Hay, he would drive her car into a lake. Yasser, by the way, is one of the people that Adnan called the night of the murder. On February 15th, police talked to Yasser Ali, as you may expect, at a pizza hut in Ellicott City, Maryland. Ali and Syed had attended the same mosque, the Islamic Society of Baltimore. And when Adnan and Hay started dating, the relationship between Ali and Syed began to deteriorate. Ali said that if Adnan killed Hay, he didn't think he'd tell anyone. He related a conversation he'd had with Adnan after Hay was killed, but in it, Adnan denied knowing anything. And it's worth noting that Yasser confirms that story, essentially, that Adnan said if he ever killed Hay, he would dump her car in, in a lake or in the harbor. Obviously, her car didn't end up in the lake or the harbor, but it's interesting that whoever it was who called, whoever that anonymous caller was, they got that part right. So to this day, we don't really know. You can dive down all those rabbit holes trying to figure out who that was, but it's interesting that they they got this part right. That same day, after talking to Ali, at 12, 11 p.m., police pull over Adnan for not wearing his seatbelt, but they really use this opportunity to confirm Adnan's cell phone number so that they can pull the records. Now, this is kind of a tactic I think you guys have seen in other cases as well, where for a traffic violation is the reason for the stop, but it may be to confirm maybe someone's voice, their cell phone number, to know more about them. Because once they know Adnan's cell phone number or the one that he's going to give the police, because remember, he may have had more than one. One, they can then subpoena those records. And when you subpoena records, there's actually laws that say the telephone company typically has to inform the customer that their records are being turned over unless it's a criminal investigation and the investigators can make a showing that letting the customer know about the subpoena could, you know, could impede the investigation and therefore the customer is not notified of such a subpoena. So by getting his phone number, they can basically pull his records and do a covert investigation without Syed knowing that they're looking into him, which is of course good because once you know the police are looking into you, you may change your behaviors, dump a phone, try to erase text messages, you know, whatever that we've seen people do to try and evade an investigation. The next day on February 16th, the police do exactly this. They subpoena Adnan cell phone records. At 246, Adnan calls Jay and talks to him for 40 seconds. This is the first time Adnan called Jay since Hay's body was found on the 9th. On February 17th, police request a helicopter search, a helicopter to search for Hay's vehicle from the air because so far they haven't been able to locate it, but the request is denied. Detectives ask beat cops to be on the lookout for the car. Beat cops are just those who are typically driving around. They're t- typically who you think of to do traffic stops. They are boots on the ground. They also receive Adnan cell records with the cell site locations redacted. Using a reverse directory, the police make a list of people to talk to based on who the cell phone called the day Hay went missing, including Jennifer Pusateri. And it's funny, there are people who actually point to the helicopter being denied as evidence that the police knew where the car was, which is just, I mean, right up there with your best like 9-11 conspiracies, because then you have to believe it's not only just some homicide detectives who know where the car is, but like higher ups in the investigation know where the car is and they want to protect its location. So they're saying, no, we can't, we can't have a helicopter look for it. They might find it, you know, and it's just, it's one of those things that kind of... I don't know. It surprises me that that anyone would think that. The reality is it got denied probably because of just pure bureaucracy. Like, no, you can't have a helicopter. Come on. We're not going to use a helicopter to look for a car. Send the beat cops out. And that's what they do. And I think that's a much more likely explanation for why they decided not to use the expense of a helicopter to look for a car, which I don't know. Are you going to be able to tell it's her car looking down from the helicopter? 
frankly, probably not. It's going to look like every other helicopter. And that's right. We've seen these sort of administrative decisions all the time because it is really expensive to send those helicopters up. And also her body's been found. So you can imagine if she were still a missing person, perhaps they would grant the helicopter request because every minute counts. If they are able to find the car, they may be able to find her and maybe save her life. But here it's been over a month. Her body's found. We know she is deceased. This is just for investigative purposes. It's not for imminent danger, which is typically what I see these helicopter, you know, helicopters are used for. There's like an active kidnapping or an active chase and you need to get, you need to get somebody. But I remember seeing the bill one time for these, one of these helicopter rides and it was like astronomical. It was way more expensive than I realized a helicopter ride, I guess, would be. And these police, they, they obviously have budgets that they have to run on as well. So now we are to February 18th. So the police, they have the cell phones, but they really want a couple things. They want to know who the unidentified callers are, and they want to know where those, those location data. Well, first, they're going to seek the identity of the unidentified numbers on the call log. They also have a Mirandized recorded interview of Alonzo Sellers, who is obviously one of their top suspects. At the same time, ATT is now ordered to provide the cell tower locations that Adnan's phone pinged the day of the murder. Really interesting legal thing we're not going to spend any time on because we're already running long, but this is so new with cell phones, and AT&T is trying to protect the privacy of their people. They're like redacting this information and not giving it to the police. But the courts basically say, no, you have to give that. This is all public information. We should have a legal briefs on this because how much the information that comes from your cell phone is public and how much it should require a warrant is an endlessly fascinating topic. And, uh, and I just don't even want to get into it right now, but we will talk about that on a legal brief later on. So on February 20th, 1999, police put out a bulletin to the entire East Coast region seeking Hayes' vehicle. They haven't been able to find it. Now they're, they're asking everybody on the East Coast, look for this vehicle. At the same time, Detective Ritz, who's a homicide detective, is faxing the court order to AT&T seeking the tower locations. They will receive those two days later on February 22nd, 1990. A couple days after that, they're interviewing Alonzo Sellers once again. On the 26th, Adnan is interviewed by homicide detectives for the first time. Remember, he's been talked to several times, but they're by cops who are looking for Hay before they know that she's been murdered. He says basically at this point, now we're in the six weeks later, how much would you remember? And at this point, he says basically he remembers nothing about February 13th. Police, they also, they're going through that list of calls on a cell phone. They got Jennifer Pusteri. She got called several times. So they're thinking, oh, this could be interesting. And they go and they interview her. And according to the report, she is, quote, able to provide little information as to the victim. So they sort of move on from Jennifer Pusateri at this point. But Jennifer is spooked. And that night, she will tell her friend and sorority sister, Christy Vinson, that she knows who killed Hay and what happened to her. And recall, Christy Vinson has appeared in our story before because she's the person who says that Adnan and Jay came and visited the day that Hay was killed. And when Christy finds out that that's who was in her house, She's she's displeased. But this is this is Jennifer telling her, I know what happened. On February 27th, police contact the transit authority and ask them to search all their lots for Hayes car. Note, by the way, that it certainly doesn't seem like the police know where her car is. They are like doing an all call to beat cops to and beat cops are going to be different than your investigators. They're like a different sector of the, the police department. They probably don't work very closely with investigators typically. So you're you're talking to all parts of your large department and there are these all calls repeatedly throughout the month of February after Hay has been found to look for the car. Again, if they know where the car is, this is kind of a waste of resources. And also at some point, someone's going to be like, stop clogging up our radio lines. We know where the car is, right? And that's not happening here. This all indicates that they really don't know where the car is. At 1 p.m., police meet with attorney James Fowley, who represents Jennifer Pusateri. Now, James tells the police that Jennifer has information. Jennifer, her attorney, and Jennifer's mom come to the police station, and she tells police that on the day Hay disappeared, Jay showed up at Jennifer's house driving Adnan's Honda Accord and with Adnan's cell phone. At some point that day, Syed called Jay, and Jay left her house. 
That evening, Jay called Jennifer and told her to meet him at Westview Mall. And when Jennifer arrived, Jay got out of Adnan's car and got into hers. At that point, Jay told her what had happened to Hay. And here's the way the report reads. This is verbatim from the report. Wilds then told Pusateri that Adnan Syed had killed Hay Min Lee after school and that Syed had placed the victim's remains in the car of her 1998 Nissan Sentra. Syed then contacted Wilds via the cell phone and asked Wilds to meet him at 600 block Franklin Town Road. Wilds complied and met Syed at the location requested. Syed then opened the victim's trunk and pointed inside, showing the body to Wilds. Both Syed and Wilds followed one another, Syed in the victim's car and Wilds driving Syed's car, responding to the 4400 block of North Franklin Town Road. Syed then removes the body of Heyman Lee and buries Same in a shallow grave. Wilds then follows Syed to several locations where Syed was to park the victim's car. The victim's auto was then parked in the rear alley of 600 Edgewood Street in southwest Baltimore. Syed then gets into his car and both Syed and Wilds drive to Westview Mall and meet Jennifer Pusateri. So that's the report. The next day, Pusateri picked up Wilds and he discarded his clothes in a dumpster behind a drugstore. And we're going to spend a lot of time on Jennifer's story. We're going to do an episode on Jennifer and Jay's story, but this is the report. So this is what the cops writing down about what he's hearing. What's interesting about this, this is basically the story. This is the story that's going to be told from now until the end of time. It's the story that's going to be told by Jay. It's going to story they're going to testify to at trial. Things change. The story is obviously much more complicated when Jay lays it all out. He includes a bunch of extraneous stuff, some of which is not true. The location of where the body, where he first saw the body changes, though it seems like the first statement he tells the police is consistent with what Jennifer believes to be true, but she's just telling, you know, what he told her. And we focus so much on Jay and Jay's story and what Jay's going to tell the police for good reason. And a lot of people are going to say that, Jay was coached by the police, that he was told exactly what to say, and maybe he was. But before that happened, Jennifer Pusateri and her lawyer sat down with the police, who up to that point didn't really know anything, and told them this story. Jennifer Pusateri is the first person to tell the story that has all the beats that we're going to see throughout. And she does it with her lawyer sitting on one side and her mom sitting on the other. One thing I think we can say for certain about Jennifer Pusateri is... The police weren't coaching her, or if they were, her mom and her lawyer, once again, on each side of her, were doing a really bad job of making sure the police didn't get Jennifer involved in this. This is a story she's telling that she walked into that police station with, wherever she got it from. Maybe Jay made up the whole thing and told her that, but she got it from Jay or somebody else. She didn't get it from the cops. So at this point, the police want to talk to Jay Wilds. At 11.30 p.m., the police go to Southwestern Video, which is the porn store that Jay works at, to look for him. He is taken to the station and gives a recorded statement. Here's the way the report reads of the interview. Let me read the interview in a second. That's 11.30. They pick him up. They bring him in. At about 12.35, he's going to waive his Miranda rights. They're going to start talking to him. They have what's called a pre-interview. This happens in every interview. A lot of people focus on this because it's in this 55 minutes where the police are going to, you know, they're going to give Jay all the information he needs to give, and he's going to tell the whole story. According to the police notes from this interview, basically what Jay initially tells them was, you know, that day I had to pick up a gift from my girlfriend, so I walked. That's his initial story. Is I walked from my house to the mall. The police are like, that's a pretty long walk, wasn't it? And he's like, well, it was only a little over a mile. went that far. And they sort of go back and forth. The police are like, look, we know you're not telling us the truth. We know that you had Adnan's car that day. We've got all these cell phone records. We know you called Jennifer Pusateri. You just need to tell us the truth. And at some point, Jay says, okay, fine. I will tell you the truth. And he tells them essentially what happened. At that point, the police are going to start the recorded interview. This is the 90s. Now, pretty much everything you say is recorded. At the time, you really only started recording when she got into the meat of it. But nevertheless, they start talking to him at 1235. They start recording at 130. That is not a long time. If you've ever been in an interview with a witness, which some of you have because you're lawyers, you know 55 minutes, 
not a long time. Alice and I have done a lot of interviews, and they go on for forever. So there were a lot of interesting things said in that time, but don't feel like this was the police with Jay for hours on end, and then they did the recorded interview. They started the recorded interview less than an hour after he walked in to that room. Here's what the police report says about his interview. And as I said, we're going to go through these interviews in depth, but we want to give you a general idea as we're working through the timeline. While it's indicated that on the 12th of January, 1999, in the evening, he had the occasion to speak with Adnan Saad on the telephone, at which time they made plans in the morning to go shopping. The next day, Saad picked him up at his house, and they both went to Westview Mall. Wiles then transported Saad to Woodlawn High School, and Adnan gives Wilds the car and cell phone. Note that up to this point, this is all agreed. Everybody agrees this is what happened. This is obviously where it gets interesting. Prior to exiting the car, Syed tells Wilds that he is going to kill Hay Min Lee and tells Wilds to wait for his call around 3.30 p.m. Wilds then drives Syed's auto to Jennifer Pusateri's house and meets Jennifer's brother, Mark. Both play video games until Jennifer gets home from work. I think Jennifer worked at a pool. At approximately 3.45, Adnan calls Wilds on Syed's cell phone, which Wilds has in his possession. Syed tells Wilds to pick him up at Edmondson Avenue and Franklin Town Road. Wilds drives Syed's car and meets him at that location where Syed pops the trunk to Haley's auto. Wilds observes the remains of Heyman Lee. Syed then tells Wilds to follow him. Syed driving the victim's car and Wilds following in Syed's car to Route 70 in Cook's Lane. This is the... Route 70 Park and Ride, as some of you have heard it called. At this time, Adnan gets into his car with Wilds, so they leave her car there. With Wilds driving and respond to a location called the Cliff in a state park and both smoke marijuana. Wilds then drives Syed back to Woodlawn High School. Syed then calls Wilds on the cell phone, and Wilds responds back to Woodlawn High School and picks Syed up. Wilds drives back to Route 70, and Syed drives the victim's car to Wilds' house, where Wilds obtains digging tools. Syed then drives to Lincoln Park and buries the victim in a shallow grave while Wilds watches. Wilds then follows Syed to the 300 block of Edgewood Street, so Jennifer got a little bit off on the location. In southwest Baltimore, where Syed parks the auto, Syed gets in the auto with Wilds and drives off. Wilds then contacts Jennifer Pusateri and tells her to meet them at Westview Mall in front of Value City. Wilds gets in the car with Pusateri, at which time Wilds tells Pusateri of the day's events. So that interview starts at about 1.30. They wrap it up around 2.21 a.m., at which point they all climb in the car together and drive off to the 300 block of Edgewood. There, they find the 1998 Nissan Sentra owned by Hay. And it doesn't take them long after this to arrest Adnan, and the public is made aware for the first time that Hay was strangled, which is important because Jennifer Pusateri and Jay both say that Hay was strangled. So this is all very helpful to know in terms of the interview of him talking about what happened obviously matches on very well to what Jennifer has said. And also, he says... it. It happens in about 50 minutes, which is a pretty, like like Brett said, we have interviews that last for four or five, six hours. So it's a relatively succinct interview, especially if you're trying, if you're trying to coach someone in an interview to say something, it takes a lot longer. We have this experience when someone just doesn't remember something, we're maybe not coaching them, but we know that they should know more. And we're trying to help them remember and asking them follow-up questions and kind of leading them to look at the records and to confront them with evidence that can help refresh their memory, it takes a long, long time. If someone's lying, it takes a long time because we confront them with contradicting evidence. All I'm trying to say is I think if you were trying to coach someone, it would take a lot longer than 50 minutes. And they, you know, this is seemingly brand new information to the police because as soon as they finish this interview with Jay, they jump in the car to go look for Hayes' car. And of course, they find it. On March 1st, and February 29th is actually written on the police report, but that day didn't exist that year because it was not a leap year. So it's actually March 1st. There was a typographical error. Police interview Krista Lynn Myers, who was friends with both Hay and Adnan, and she reported that Hay and Adnan had started dating in May of 1998, but broken up in November of that year. Shortly thereafter, they got back together, but Hay breaks it off again just before Christmas. So Chris's recollection of Hay and Adnan's relationship and when they got back together is pretty consistent with Hay's diary, if you remember the entries. 
Douglas Colbert and Chris Floor represent Adnan at his bail hearing, and defense PI Andrew Drew Davis starts canvassing the area and talking to all the involved parties on behalf of the defense team. In other words, the defense investigation is following very closely to what the prosecution knows at the same time, right? The investigators for the defense are already getting started. They're not really far behind because this is an evolving investigation. I point that out just to say basically the defense is having access to the same evidence basically in the same timeline as the prosecution is. We're not talking about the defense getting this months or years later and then doing their investigation. They're actually following upon it as soon as the prosecutors are getting the information. Now, Asia McLean writes her first letter to Adnan saying that she saw him at the library the day of the murder. Asia also supposedly goes to Adnan's house. On March 2nd, Asia writes a second letter to Adnan, and police fax AT&T for the cell phone location map, despite having already received it on February 22nd. And I just want to point one thing out about this. I mean, I'll point out two things. The first thing is, we're going to talk about Christina Gutierrez a lot, and... I actually probably won't talk about her that much because she's not that interesting, but a lot of people have pointed to her. She's going to be his lawyer later on. There's going to be ineffective assistance. Counsel claims against her. One of those is going to be she didn't interview Asia, who wrote these two letters. Note, she does not represent Adnan at this time. He has other lawyers and a investigator who represent him. So one of the things that's never been clear to me is if Asia wrote these letters on March 1st and 2nd and Adnan got them at that time, why is it Christina Gutierrez who was the one who didn't investigate? You would think the person who would investigate would be the people who represented him at that time, particularly if they've just taken him on and here's an alibi that appears out of nowhere. So that's always been weird to me. And it's it's one of those things that I think it's a little unclear exactly what the relationship was between Adnan's first legal team and the legal team that he is going to have later on. I'll say the second thing, too. The police are asking for the cell phone location map again, which is the kind of thing that happens in investigations all the time. But I think one thing that makes perfectly clear that at this time, on March 2nd, they don't have a map of everywhere the phone was. Like, they don't they don't know exactly where Adnan was. And why that's important is because if you think this is a frame job, you also think that by the time they talk to Jennifer and Jay... They already know everything. They've already sort of laid it all out, and that's why they're selling them the story they are. They're feeding them that story so they'll, they'll tell it back to them, and it'll match the cell phone map. They don't have that yet. They don't really have it until sometime in March. Mm, that's a great point. On March 3rd, Drew Davis, the investigator for Adnan's first attorneys, turns in a bill for four hours. And during those four hours, he visited the library where Asia said she saw Adnan and he interviewed the security guard there, a man named Steve, who worked for Wackenut Security. It's unclear what he learned, but this interview is important when trying to understand the Asia McLean issue. On March 5th, Adnan is fired from his job as an EMT, but not because of the murder or the allegations of his involvement in the murder, but because this is when they first realize he's only 17 and he has to be 18 to hold that job. On March 15th, police interview Jay Wilds again. And on April 13th, Wilds is interviewed yet again. Police note this interview was helpful in, quote, addressing and clarifying discrepancies. And it's April 13th interview that you often hear is sort of like when all the coaching happens. And we're going to talk about that a lot later. One thing that's important, Drew Davis. So he's that private investigator, the one that works for Adnan's first two defense attorneys. And he's not just sitting around. He's on the job. Where does he go? He goes to the library. Why would he go to the library on March 3rd? Maybe because Adnan had told him, or the lawyer, his lawyers had told him, hey, we got these two letters from this, this girl, and she says she saw Adnan at the library that day. So where does he go? He goes to the library, and he interviews a security guard at the library. We don't know what the interview was about. We don't know what the security guard said. We don't know if he tried to see any security cameras, though if he did, probably by that point, like most security cameras, they would have been overwritten. But just once again... This is interesting if, if you've always believed that no one ever investigated Asia McLean. I think it's pretty clear that Adnan's first lawyers did. Now, maybe they didn't do enough, and maybe Christina should have done more, but it doesn't seem to me that it is the case that nobody ever went to this library and talked to anybody or tried to follow up on Asia McLean and what she was saying. 
On April 16th, Christina Gutierrez, who had previously represented Bilal, remember Bilal? We talked about him some. She actually represented him earlier on. She meets with Adnan. Two days later, she will agree to represent him. The state will actually attempt to disqualify her. And the reason they do that is because she was known as a bulldog. She was known as one of the best defense attorneys in Maryland. And by goodness, if they can get her disqualified, they're going to do it. They try and do it. But Bilal waives any conflict. So he waives any conflict he would have. And that's the way it works. The person who was represented waives the conflict. You don't have to worry about it. Adnan waives the conflict as well. And so she gets to represent Adnan. And he actually, at at this point, suggests to her that he might be interested in a plea deal. And he asks her to talk to the state's attorney about it. The next time they meet, Adnan was told that the state would not be offering him a deal. He raises the possibility of a plea again with Gutierrez after his first trial ends in a mistrial but once again the state isn't interested according to Gutierrez the state would later claim that they never offered Adnan a deal and they were never aware of any offer by Adnan to plead guilty so we don't really know whether Adnan asked for this deal and the state either doesn't have a record of it or maybe Christina Gutierrez never asked for it or whether Adnan's lying about it now and saying I asked for a plea deal and didn't get it we don't know we just know that according to statements we have in the defense file adding on it a couple different points was interested in at least seeing what kind of deal he might be able to make with the state on april 28th police received information that ernest carter had told a friend that he saw a dead body in the trunk of a car if you've listened to serial carter is the quote-unquote neighbor boy the police would talk to carter and he'd deny seeing any such thing Interestingly, Carter wasn't just a neighbor boy. He was one of Jay Wilde's best friends. On September 7th, Wilde's will agree to a plea agreement whereby he pleads guilty to accessory after the fact and agrees to testify against Adnan. The state agrees to recommend a sentence of five years with all but two suspended, which means they're going to agree that at least three of those years are a suspended sentence. So the way that would work if if he was sentenced that way is he would go to prison for two years The three years would be suspended, and as long as he didn't do anything, those three years just go away. He never actually has to serve that time. And he would have three years of supervised probation afterwards. And the expectation is he's going to spend some time in prison. I think that's what everybody thought, but he draws a good judge, apparently, because the judge eventually will not sentence him to any time incarcerated. He actually ends up getting probation, and he completes that probation, so he never has to go to prison for accessory after the fact. Adnan Syed will end up facing two trials. The first will end in a mistrial, but on February 25th, 2000, he was convicted for the murder of Heyman Lee, and essentially the rest is history. He has many, many appeals. Serial comes out in 2014. Last year, his conviction is vacated. This year, the Maryland Court of Appeals reinstated that conviction. He has now appealed to the Supreme Court. He has asked the Supreme Court to stay the decision of the Court of Appeals until they decide whether or not they're going to take his case. They've agreed to do that. That's standard operating procedure, not surprising at all. And at this point, when we're recording, we're still waiting to see whether or not the Supreme Court will take the case at all. And if they do, it'll probably be another six months to a year before we find out what exactly they're going to do. So that's sort of where we are timeline-wise in this case. And as you can tell, in a short five episodes, we were able to finish the timeline. So (laughs) no, this is obviously very important to put this together and hopefully gives you a framework by which we can start discussing the other aspects of this case because there are many, many aspects. But there's a reason we always start with the timeline and this case is no different. The timeline matters here. And like we said at the beginning of this episode, there are knowable things about this timeline, even if not every single entry is rock solid. We do have reason to believe that much of what we've put in this timeline here, at least, has corroborating facts. And you can already begin to tell a lot about Jay's potential involvement, Adnan's potential involvement, Hay's mental space, 
Don, Alonzo Sellers, just from the timeline in and of itself, before we even begin to kind of discuss the interesting aspects and factors surrounding this timeline. And we got a lot to talk about. We're nowhere near done with this case. We're not doing theories next week or anything. Now we're going to start diving in, into specific aspects of the case. And next week, for instance, we're going to talk more about Asia McLean and her letters. We're going to read them to you and go through them so you know them. We're going to talk about whether or not the alibi holds up, whether or not it's believable. And we're also going to talk about a few things about the body, the location of the body, where it was found, evidence that was found at the scene. We'll talk about the autopsy. And we're going to talk about lividity, which is something that people are very interested in. But we've got a lot over the next few episodes. I anticipate this one's going to run... I mean, what? What, Alice? This is already episode five, right? Am I making that up? More, th- more than five. It will definitely be more than five. <laughs> it's probably going to be more like, well, I don't even want to speculate, but I don't know what it's I'm going to put. It's not going to be more than 10 weeks, but it will be more than exactly. 10 episodes. It will be more than 10 episodes, but not more than 10 weeks. Well, Alice, we've run a little long, but do you want to do a question real yeah, quick? Let's do a question. I haven't okay. heard a baby cry yet. We are, we are turning a corner here. <laughs> okay, so I will... Okay, let's see. What should I ask you? Okay, so this, so this is from All Right, I've Had Enough. And this is the kind of question that, you know, in 20 years, no one will be able to answer. And it is, what is the coolest thing you have ever received in the mail? No. Oh, like, as a podcaster, or just in life? <laughs> in life. Oh, okay. Okay. The most memorable thing I have received in the mail was when I was in law school and I lived in New Haven where Yale is and it was like dead of winter, which meant that getting packages in general was like difficult because there was ice, you know, everywhere I lived in like a, you know, the East Rock, which is historic homes. And we had like icy brick steps that were 150 years old and everything falling apart. So when like really heavy packages came, the UPS or USPS, whoever was delivering it would just st- like put it on the sidewalk where all the ice was and you'd have to figure out how to get it up icy steps. And so I get, I like look out the window and I see a UPS truck and the the UPS man literally kicks this box out of, out of the like little door, right? He literally like, I see a leg just kicking this like massive box and it's clear that's very heavy. And he's just like, no, I'm not, I'm not moving this and like throwing out my back and slipping on the ice. So he kicks this big box out and it, it like tumbles out and barely makes it onto the sidewalk. It's like half on the curve. And I was like, hmm. Is that for me or my roommate? So I walk outside and it's snowing as it often is. It's a new haven. And I look at the the package and it's for me. And I see the weight on the package because it's like, you know, someone had bought a stay up for it. And it said on there, it was like 28 pounds. And I was like, that's really heavy. Like what is in this box? And, you know, of course I wasn't a didn't know much about true crime back then. So I was like, yeah, let's bring this 28 pound box into my house and figure it out then. So I dragged this box up like icy steps. I like go get ropes. I don't know why I didn't open it and just like carry the things in. But I was like, let's carry. So I'm pulling it up the steps, make it into my house barely. And I open up this package and it is 28 pounds of onions, (laughs) like like yellow onions just put into the box with like it is not from like a fancy onion farm or like it's not like butcher box or anything like that it's it's literally onions and i look at the package and it is sent from my mother and she had like raw unpackaged yellow onions with all the like flaky stuff on the outside falling all over the place getting all over my floor and it's 28 pounds of onions so i call my mom and i'm like hey did you just spend a fortune to send me 28 pounds of onions? She goes, yes, they were on sale at the grocery store. <laughs> she sent it from Texas and it costs like $55 to send 28 pounds of onions to me. I Why? hope you ate every one of those onions. I hope you had I French onion not... soup until the end of time. <laughs> and that pretty much tells you about my mom in a nutshell. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> what my about mom, you, when I was in law school, she used to send me pound cakes. 
in the mail. That's much more delicious and, and normal. And man, this made me feel so much like I have a song. I love those. Mom, if you're listening, those are, those are so special to me. I always remember those. <laughs> so that could be my answer to my question, but I'm going to answer. So I have two things. I'm going to cheat. Can I do two things? And <laughs> no, go for it. <laughs> so the first, so some of you guys know that I'm a very unsuccessful writer of horror novels. And when you write novels, when you publish a novel, at some point you get like a box with your books in it. And that was pretty cool. Like the first time I ever got my own book in a box, it was like the end of uh, Back to the Future when George opens up his box and he's got his book. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Like you pull out your book that you wrote and it's got like your name on it and like everything written in it. That was pretty awesome. So I'm going to say that that one's that one's pretty close to the top. And the other one, and this is like, this is we're going to lose thousands of fans for me saying things like this. But the other one was when I got when I got into Harvard, that acceptance was pretty awesome because it I had just gone to Texas. I'd gone to Texas to visit because I was thinking about going to talk, Texas for law school. And I got home. Wait, have we talked and, about this? You know, I almost went no. to Texas. We could have gone been classmates. We could have been not classmates. Not really. We're like I would have been a little older than you. I would have been your mentor. Any, any, you would have been my mentee. You know, what could you teach awesome. me? Yes. Everything, Alice. <laughs> everything. Sorry. Please keep Just going. Just not how to like, you know, ride horses or dance or be a <laughs> farmer. Or okay. Scuba your story. Your story. Or, Nobody anyways. cares about me. Your so, story. So I got to my, my mailbox and there was a key in it, which meant I had like a big box. So I took my key and I took out this box and it was this huge box and it was from Harvard. And I thought to myself, surely they would not send me this big a package to either reject me or waitlist me, right? But you never know. <laughs> so I took it upstairs and I called my future wife and I was like, I have this box from Harvard. And I opened it up and sure enough, it was like all this. It was like, you've been accepted. Swag. And it was awesome. Yeah. Wait, what did you so. get in your Harvard acceptance box? Because I want to, Yale did not give us an awesome swag box. Well, it wasn't like swag so much. It was just like a whole lot of information. It was like a oh. binder with oh. like all this information about, you know, how to accept and how to get it, how to get housing and like, and how to pay for it. That was a big chunk of it because it was really expensive. I uh, always thought the Yale, the one thing we got from Yale for acceptance, I thought was so, I thought it was like a jerk move. <laughs> So like back in the day, we didn't actually get acceptance letters like you got a call from the admissions office and then it would be followed up with a letter. But like every student who got accepted would get a call and the New Haven area code is 203. And so everyone would be waiting for a 203 number to call them because you didn't get a call to reject you. You only got a call if you were accepted. And so when we got accepted, we all got a shirt that had parentheses 203 and that's it. Isn't that like so like I felt like such a jerk. I never wore it because I felt like such a jerk. <laughs> all right. Well, we finished up the timeline. I'm sure you guys have thoughts, questions. I'm sure going to correct all the like couple minutes here and couple minutes there. We got off or like where we said they talked to this person. But they really talked to this other person. We can't wait to hear all of your criticisms of what we've done so far. So please email us prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Hello to all of you watching on youtube and thank you so much to those of you who've joined us for this live recording of this episode and for those of you on patreon who maybe could not join us early but are listening early and ad free to these episodes we love you guys we have so much fun with you thank you for making this entire thing so enjoyable we're going to be back next week with more on this case sorry you're only getting one episode this week we were too efficient alice too efficient but we'll be back next week, and who knows, maybe that one will go too. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Hello, everybody, and <laughs> sorry. Are you laughing because you know that you've let me down as my friend? Yeah. Uh huh. Well, it's really hard. Face. It's it hard like... to look me in the face and say no, right? That's right. You laugh, but I know you're crying on the inside. I am. Little tears. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> look at this. Not laughing. I know. Hurt. <laughs> how, long, how long have you been drinking? It's only. It's only like thirty. I haven't been drinking at all.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, okay. Do I need I to mute my time. video? Am I no, distracting? No, I wasn't looking at you. Is my I beauty distracting? <laughs> it's so distracting. Okay, here we go. We got it. We got it. We got it this time. Professional. But hey, breaks it off again just before Christmas. Douglas. <laughs> what is that? Are you it's watching my, football my bottle. while we talk? No, it's my bottle opener. So, <laughs> roll time. the biggest blockbusters this summer with Popcorn Summer Movies on Pluto TV. Experience non-stop action with the first four Mission Impossible movies and Top Gun. Laugh out loud to comedies like Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and The Backup Plan. With thousands of free movies, Pluto TV has something for everyone. Available on live TV.